Hello, and welcome to my show on civil rights. My name is Barbara Bullen, and I'm one of the radio hosts for the New Heights Show on Education and the New Heights Educational Group. I hope you enjoy the show, and I'm asking our listeners to consider becoming a sponsor. This show is pre-recorded. This show is the second, based on Susan B. Anthony, Women's Suffrage, Women's Rights, and Abolitionist. The information is taken from wikipedia.org. Anthony and Stanton initiated the project of writing the history of the women's suffrage movement in 1876. Anthony had for years saved letters, newspaper clippings, and other materials of historical value to the women's movement. In 1876, she moved into the Stanton household in New Jersey, along with several trunks and boxes of these materials to begin working with Stanton on the history of women suffrage. Anthony hated this type of work. In her letters, she said the project makes me feel growly all the time. No war house, I'm sorry, no war horse ever panted for the rush of battle more than one for outside work. I love to make history, but hate to write it. The work absorbed much of her time for several years, although she continued to work on other women's suffrage activities. She acted as her own publisher, which presented several problems, including finding space for the inventory. She was forced to limit the number of books she was storing in the attic of her sister's house because the weight was threatening to collapse the structure. Originally envisioned as a modest publication, that could be produced quickly, the history evolved into a six-volume work of more than 5,700 pages, written over a period of 41 years. The first three volumes, which covered the movement up to 1885, were published between 1881 and 1886 and were produced by Stanton, Anthony and Matilda Jocelyn Gage. Anthony handled the production details and the extensive correspondence with contributors. Anthony published Volume 4, which covers the period from 1883 to 1900. In 1902, after Stanton's death, with the help of Ida Husted Harper, Anthony's designated biographer, the last two volumes which bring the history up to 1920 were completed in 1922 by Harper after Anthony's death. The history of women's suffrage preserves an enormous amount of material that might have been lost forever. Written by leaders of one wing of the divided women's movement, Lucy Stone, their, mind, their main rival, refused to have anything to do with the project. It does not, however, give a balanced view of events where their rivals are concerned. It overstates the role of Anthony and Stanton, and it understates or ignores the roles of Stone and other activists who did not fit into the historical narrative that Anthony and Stanton developed. Because it was for years the main source of documentation about the suffrage movement, historians have had to uncover other sources to provide a more balanced view. Anthony travelled to Europe in 1883 for a nine-month stay, linking up with Stanton, who had arrived a few months earlier. Together, they met with leaders of European women's movements and began the process of creating an international women's organisation. The National Women's Suffrage Association, NWSA, agreed to host its founding congress. The preparatory work was handled primarily by Anthony and two of her younger colleagues in the NWSA, Rachel Foster Avery and May Wright Sewell. Delegates from 53 women's organizations in nine countries met in Washington in 1883 
I'm sorry, 1888 to form the new association, which was called the International Council of Women, ICW. The delegates represented a wide variety of organizations, including suffrage associations, professional groups, literary clubs, temperance unions, labor leagues, and missionary societies. The American Women's Suffrage Association, which had for years been a rival to the NWSA, participated in the Congress. Anthony opened the first session of the ICW and presided over most events. The ICW commanded respect at the highest levels. President Cleveland and his wife sponsored a reception at the White House for delegates to the ICW's founding Congress. The ICW's second Congress was an integral part of the World's Columbian Exposition held in Chicago in 1893. At its third Congress in London in 1899, a reception for the ICW was held at Windsor Castle at the invitation of Queen Victoria. At its fourth Congress in Berlin in 1904, Augusta Victoria, the German Empress, received the ICW leaders at her palace. Anthony played a prominent role on all four occasions. Still active, ICW is associated with, with the United Nations. The World's Columbian Exposition, also known as, as the Chicago World's Fair, was held in 1893. It hosted several world congresses, each dealing with a specialized topic such as religion, medicine, and science. At almost the last moment, the U.S. Congress decided that the exposition should also recognize the role of women. After it was over, one of the organizers of the exposition's Congress of Women revealed that Anthony had played a pivotal but hidden role in the last-minute decision. Fearing that a public campaign would rouse opposition, Anthony had worked quietly to organize support for this project among women of the political elite. Anthony increased the pressure by covertly initiating a petition that was signed by wives and daughters of Supreme Court judges, senators, cabinet members, and other dignitaries. A large structure called the Women's Building, designed by Sophia Hayden Bennett, was constructed to provide meeting and exhibition spaces for women at the exposition. Two of Anthony's closest associates were appointed to organize the Women's Congress. They arranged for the International Council of Women to make its upcoming meeting part of the exposition by expanding its scope and calling itself the World's Congress of Representative Women. This week-long Congress seated delegates from 27 countries. Its 81 sessions, many held simultaneously, were attended by over 150,000 people and women's suffrage was discussed at almost every session. Anthony spoke to large crowds at the exposition. Buffalo Bill Cody invited her as a guest to his Wild West show, located just outside the exposition. When the show opened, he rode his horse directly to her and greeted her with dramatic flair. According to a co-worker, Anthony, for the moment as enthusiastic as a girl, waved her handkerchief at him, while the big audience, catching the spirit of the scene, wildly applauded. After Anthony retired as president of the National American Women's Suffrage Association, Carrie Chapman Catt, her chosen successor, began working towards an international women's suffrage association, one of Anthony's long-time goals. The existing International Council of Women could not be expected to support a campaign for women's suffrage because it was a broad alliance whose, most, whose more conservative members would object. In 1902, Cat organized a preparatory meeting in Washington with Anthony's chair that was attended by delegates from several countries. Organized primarily by Cat, the International Women's Suffrage Alliance was created in Berlin in 1904. The founding meeting was chaired by Anthony, who was declared to be the new organization's 
honorary president and first member. According to Anthony's authorized biographer, no event ever gave Ms. Anthony such profound satisfaction as this one. Later renamed the International Alliance of Women, the organization is still active and is affiliated with the United Nations. Anthony and Stanton worked together in a close and productive relationship. From 1880 to 1886, they were together almost every day, working on the history of women's suffrage. They referred to each other as Susan and Mrs. Stanton. Anthony referred to Stanton in other ways also, not accepting an office in any organization that would place her above Stanton. In practice, this generally meant that Anthony, although ostensibly holding a less important office, handled most of the organization's daily activities. Stanton sometimes felt the weight of Anthony's determination and drive. When Stanton arrived at an important meeting in 1888 with a speech not yet written, Anthony insisted that Stanton stay in her old hotel room until she had written it, and she placed a younger colleague outside her door to make sure she did so. At Anthony's 70th birthday celebration, Stanton teased her by saying, Well, as all women are supposed to be under the thumb of some man, I prefer a tyrant of my own sex, so I shall not deny, deny the patent fact of my subjection. Their interests began to diverge somewhat as they grew older. As the drive for women's suffrage gained momentum, Anthony began to form alliances with more conservative groups, such as the Women's Christian Temperance U Union, the nation's largest women's organization, and the supporter of women's suffrage. Such moves irritated Stanton, who said, I get more radical as I get older, while she seems to grow more conservative. In 1895, Stanton published the Woman's Bible, which attacked the use of the Bible to relegate women to an inferior status. It became a highly controversial bestseller. The NAWSA voted to disavow any connection with it, despite Anthony's strong objection that such a move was unnecessary and hurtful. Even so, Anthony refused to assist with the book's preparation Telling Stanton, you say, women must be emancipated from their superstitions before enfranchisement will have any benefit, and I say just the reverse, that women must be enfranchised before they can be emancipated from their superstitions. Despite such friction, their relationship continued to be close. When Stanton died in 1902, Anthony wrote to a friend, Oh, this awful hush. It seems impossible that voice is still which I have loved to hear for fifty years. Always I have felt I must have Mrs. Stanton's opinion of things before I knew where I stood myself. I am all at sea. Having lived for years in hotels and with friends and relatives, Anthony agreed to settle into her sister, Mary Stafford Anthony's house in Rochester in 1891 at the age of 71. Her energy and stamina, which sometimes exhausted her co-workers, continued at a remarkable level. At age 75, she toured Yosemite National Park on the back of a mule. She remained as a leader of the NAWSA and continued to travel extensively on suffrage work. She also engaged in local projects. In 1893, she initiated the Rochester branch of the Women's Educational and Industrial U Union. In 1898, she called a meeting of 73 local women societies to form the Rochester Council of Women. She played a key role in raising the funds required by the University of Rochester before they would admit women students, pledging her life insurance policy to close the final funding gap. In 1896, she spent eight months on the California suffrage campaign speaking as many as three times per day in more than 30 localities. In 1900, she presided over her last NAWSA convention. During the six remaining years of her life, Anthony spoke at six more NAWSA conventions and four congressional hearings, completed the fourth volume of the History of Women's Suffrage and traveled to 18 states and to Europe. 
As Anthony's fame grew, some politicians, certainly not all of them, were happy to be publicly associated with her. Her seventieth birthday was celebrated at a national event in Washington, with prominent members of the House and Senate in attendance. Her eightieth birthday was celebrated at the White House at the invitation of President William McKinley. Right now, you might be struggling through your classes or even failing them. You might be worried that you may not finish high school. There might have even been a thought that you may not be smart enough. Well, the New Heights Educational Group begs to differ. We not only think you are smart enough, but with our help, you will complete your high school diploma. The New Heights Educational Group strives to improve your academic success through its tutoring services. To learn more, please visit newheightseducation.org and contact us. New Heights Educational Group educational resources to help reach your goals hello listeners if you're enjoying the new heights show on education and want to support or donate to our organization please visit www.newheightseducation.org and while you're there check out our online store Welcome back to the New Heights Show on Education. My name is Barbara Bullen and I'm the radio host for this show. This show is pre-recorded and focuses on the history of civil rights. A recap of the first segment of the show on Susan B. Anthony will continue. Susan B. Anthony died at the age of 86 of heart failure and pneumonia in her home in Rochester, New York on March the 13th, 1906. She was buried at Mount Hope Cemetery, Rochester. At her birthday celebration in Washington, D.C., a few days earlier, Anthony had spoken of those who'd worked with her for women's rights. There have been others also just as true and devoted to the cause. I wish I could name everyone, but with such women consecrating their lives, Failure is impossible. Failure is impossible quickly became a watchword for the women's movement. Anthony did not live to see the achievement of women's suffrage at the national level, but she could still express pride in the progress the women's movement had made. At the time of her death, women had achieved suffrage in Wyoming, Utah, Colorado, and Idaho, and several larger states followed soon after. Legal rights for married women had been established in most states and most professions had at least a few women members. 36,000 women were attending colleges and universities up from zero a few decades earlier. Two years before she died, Anthony said, the world has never witnessed a greater revolution than in the sphere of women during this 50 years. Part of the revolution, in Anthony's view, was in ways of thinking. In a speech in 1889, she noted that women had always been taught that their purpose was to serve men. But now, after 40 years of agitation, the idea is beginning to, pre to prevail that women were created for themselves, for their own happiness, and for the welfare of the world. Anthony was sure that women's suffrage would be achieved but she also feared that people would forget how difficult it was to achieve it, as they were already forgetting the ordeals of the recent past. We shall some day be heeded, and when we shall have our amendment to the Constitution of the United States, everybody will think it was always so, just exactly as many young people think that all the privileges, all the freedom, all the enjoyments which women now possesses always were hers. They have no idea of how every single inch of ground that she stands upon today has been gained by the hard work of some little handful of women of the past. Anthony's death was widely mourned. Clara Barton, founder of the American Red Cross, said just before Anthony's death, a few days ago, someone said to me that every woman should stand with bared head before Susan B. Anthony. Yes, I answered, and every man as well. For ages he has been caring, for ages 
He has been trying to carry the burden of life's responsibilities alone. Just now it is new and strange and men cannot comprehend what it would mean, but the change is not far away. In her history of the women's suffrage movement, Eleanor Flexner wrote, If Lucretia Mott typified the moral force of the movement, if Lucy Stone was its most gifted orator, and Mrs. Stanton its most outstanding philosopher, Susan Anthony was its incomparable organizer who gave it force and direction for half a century. The 19th Amendment, which prohibited the denial of suffrage because of sex, was colloquially known as the Susan B. Anthony Amendment. After it was ratified in 1920, the National American Women's Suffrage Association, whose character and policies were strongly influenced by Anthony, was transformed into the League of Women Voters, which is still an active force in U.S. politics. Anthony's papers are held in library collections of Harvard University and its Radcliffe Institute, Rutgers University, the Library of Congress, and Smith College. She is the author of six-volume work, History of Women's Suffrage, 1881. Anthony was raised a Quaker, but her religious heritage was mixed. On her mother's side, her grandmother was a Baptist, and her grandfather was a Universalist. Her father was a radical Quaker who chafed under the restrictions of his more conservative congregation. When the Quakers split in the 1820s into Orthodox and Hicksites, her family sided with the Hicksites, which Anthony, Anthony described as a radical side of the, of the Unitarian. In 1848, three years after the Anthony family moved to Rochester, a group of about 200 Quakers withdrew from the Hicksite organization in western New York partly because they wanted to walk, walk, work in social reform movements without interference from that organization. Some of them included the Anthony family began attending services at the First Unitarian Church of Rochester. When Susan B. Anthony returned home from teaching in 1849 she joined her family in attending services there and she remained with the Rochester Unitarians for the rest of her life. Her sense of spirituality was strongly influenced by William Henry Channing, a nationally known minister of that church who also assisted her with several of her reform projects. Anthony was listed as a member of First Unitarian in a church history written in 1881. Anthony, proud of her Quaker roots, continued to describe herself as a Quaker. However, she maintained her membership in the local Hicksite body, but did not attend its meetings. She joined the Congregational Friends, an organization that was created by Quakers in western New York after the 1848 split among Quakers there. This group soon ceased to operate as a religious body, however, and changed its name to the Friends of Human Progress, organizing annual meetings in support of social reform that welcomed everyone, including Christians, Jews, Mohammedans, and pagans. Anthony served as secretary of this group in 1857. In 1859, during a period when Rochester Unitarians were gravely impaired by factionalism, Anthony unsuccessfully attempted to start a free church in Rochester where no doctrines should be preached and all should be welcome. She used as a model the Boston Church of Theodore Parker, a Unitarian minister who helped to set the direction of his denomination by rejecting the authority of the Bible and the validity of miracles. Anthony later became close friends with William Channing Gannett, who became the minister of the Unitarian Church in Rochester in 1889 and with his wife Mary, who came from a Quaker background. William had been a national leader of the successful movement within the Unitarian denomination to end the practice of binding it by formal creed, thereby opening its membership to non-Christians and even non-thesis, a goal for the, for the denomination that resembled Anthony's goal for her proposed free church. After Anthony reduced her odious 
travel schedule and made her room and made her home in Rochester in 1891. She resumed regular attendance at First Unitarian and also worked with the Gannets on local reform projects. Her sister Mary Stafford Anthony, whose home had provided a resting place for Anthony during her years of frequent travel, had long played an active role in this church. Her first public speech, delivered at a temperance meeting as a young woman, contained frequent references to God. She soon took a more distant approach, however. While in Europe in 1883, Anthony helped a desperately poor Irish mother of six children, noting that the evidences were that God was about to add a number seven to her flock she later commented, what a dreadful creature their God must be to keep sending hungry mouths while he withholds the bread to, feed, to fill them. Elizabeth Cady Stanton said that Anthony was an agnostic, adding, to her, work is worship. Her belief is not orthodox, but it, but it is religious. Anthony herself said, work and worship are one with me. I cannot imagine a God of the universe made happy by my getting down on my knees and calling him great. When Anthony's sister Hannah was on her deathbed, she asked Susan to talk about the great beyond, but Anthony later wrote, I could not dash your faith with my doubts, nor could I pretend a faith I had not, so I was silent in the dread presence of death. When an organization offered to sponsor a women's rights convention, on the condition that no speaker should say anything which would seem like an attack on Christianity, Anthony wrote to a friend, I wonder if they'll be as particular to warn all other speakers not to say anything which shall sound like an attack on liberal religion. They never seem to think we have any feelings to be hurt, but we have to sit under their reiteration of orthodox cant and dogma. As a teen, Anthony went to parties and she had offers of marriage when she was older, but there is no record of her ever having a serious romance. Anthony loved children, however, and helped raise the children in the Stanton household. Referring to her niece, she wrote, The dear little Lucy engrosses much of my time and thoughts. A child one loves is a constant benediction to the soul, whether or not it helps to the accomplishment of great intellectual feats. As a, young woman, as a young worker in the women's rights movement, Anthony expressed frustration when some of her co-workers began to marry and have children, sharply curtailing their ability to work for the understaffed movement. When Lucy Stone abandoned her pledge to stay single, Anthony's scolding remarks caused a temporary rupture in their friendship. Journalists repeatedly asked Anthony to explain why she never married. She answered one by saying, It always happened that the men I wanted were those I could not get, and those who wanted me I wouldn't have. To another she answered, I never found the man who was necessary to my happiness. I was very well as I was. To a third she said, I never felt I could give up my life of freedom to become a man's housekeeper. When I was young, if a girl married poor, she became a housekeeper and a drudge. Well, she became a pet and a doll. Just think, had I married at 20, I would have been a drudge or a doll for 59 years. Think of it. Anthony firstly opposed laws that gave husbands complete control over the marriage. Blackstone's commentaries, the basis for the legal systems in most states at the time, stated that by marriage, the husband and wife are one person in law. That is, the very being or legal existence of the woman is suspended during the marriage. In a speech in 1877, Anthony predicted an epoch of single women. If women will not accept marriage with subjugation, nor men proffer it without, there is, there can be, no alternative. The woman who will not be ruled must live without marriage. Anthony showed little interest in the topic of abortion. Andy Gordon, who led the Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony Papers Project, an undertaking to collect and document materials written by those two co-workers, 
said that Anthony never voiced an opinion about the sanctity of fetal life, and she never voiced an opinion about using the power of the state to require that pregnancies be brought to term. Lynn Sher, author of a biographer of Anthony, said that Anthony never stated her views on abortion, saying, I look desperately for some kind of evidence, one way or the other, as to what her position was, and it just wasn't there. A dispute over Anthony's views on abortion developed after 1989 when some members of the anti-abortion movement began to portray Anthony as an outspoken critic of abortion. Citing various statements they said she had made, the anti-abortion advocacy group Susan B. Anthony List named itself after her on this basis. Gordon, Scheer and others contested this portrayal, saying these statements either were not made by Anthony, were not about abortion, or had been taken out of context. This comes to the conclusion of the show. The next show will be the continuation of Susan B. Anthony. Thank you for listening. You can reach me by email barbara b at newheightseducation.org. Be sure to join me every Sunday at radio.newheightseducation.org, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, as I discuss the history of civil rights. Also join Pamela Clark's pre-recorded shows, which airs Wednesday by 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Civil rights is our right. Have a great week. We hope you enjoyed today's show. Don't forget to rate us and follow us on your podcast player. Check out our show page, radio.newheightseducation.org, for monthly announcements and other happenings.